um, YouTube channel. So if you wish to not have your face shown, um, you can feel free to turn off your video feature from um, Zoom, all right? So this evening, we're going to discuss what is special education? What does it mean for a child to be placed on an IEP? Um, how do you request for a child to be tested? Um, why would a child be tested? What supports would be available to a child if they were placed on an IEP? Uh, what are some alternatives to an IEP, such as a 504? Um, and what we don't want this session to become is for parents to feel like, oh, I need to request an I IEP or I need to request a 504. That's not what this session is for. It is an informational session for parents who may be going through the IEP process or currently have a child on an IEP or you just wanted to have some information, you know, for future reference or just to have it in the event you have always questioned what is special education. We're also going to discuss gifted education. So what is gifted education? What is a WEP? A lot of parents may not know that if a child is gifted, they're also on a learning plan. Uh, what are the pullout services for gifted children? How is a child identified as gifted? And if you wanted your child tested for gifted services, how could you go about doing that? And I found that a lot of our parents don't know that we actually have a gifted teacher who serves kindergarten, first and second grade. And we have her online today, Mrs. Galbraith. So oftentimes we have children who go see Mrs. Galbraith once a week and she's going to provide more detail about that. But we also have Mrs. Boaton who serves as our gifted teacher for third, fourth, and fifth grade. And she does a lot of enrichment work with our students. And she is the pullout teacher. She's absent um, this evening, but she has provided a lot of information that Mrs. Galbraith will share with us. So without further ado, let's get started. Parents, if you have a question, please feel free to place your question in the chat. Um, after each presenter, I will provide time for us to um, answer at least two questions, but we want to keep our presentations rolling because we want to end on time at 7 p.m. and honor everyone's evening because we know this is family time and dinner time. So Mrs. Raybuck, you can get started. I will make you a co-host. All right, sorry guys, it's been a minute since I have been on Zoom. <laughs> so I'm trying to get my presentation going at the same time. Sorry, one second. All right, now I think we're good. So I'm Mrs. Raybuck. I am the kindergarten, third grade special education teacher at Parkmore. Um, and I'm just gonna go over kind of like what is special education? What's the process like look like at our school and in our district? Um, so simply put, special education is the range of services that students will receive in order to help them make progress in school if they have a disability that adversely affects their education. So if your student um, is already on an IEP, then they have a formalized legal plan that identifies their educational needs and sets goals for meeting those needs. Um, and then we'll go through what it looks like to get to this point. 
But right now, all of the students that I see in my classroom, they all have this plan. And within this plan, there's, it's like a 20 page document, it's huge, but these are like the main important chunks that I pulled out for you guys. So within this IEP, um, we have a child's profile, which is just all about your child. It highlights their background information, their medical history, school information, grades, personal strengths, assessment information. Um, there's also the goals and objectives. This I think is like the biggest chunk of your IEP. This um, has your child's goals. It talks about what are they learning through this entire full year. And the goals are based on their weaknesses. And um, we'll go over that in a second as well. Another chunk of IEP is their specially designed services. So this is just the specific methods that um, the teachers are going to use to reach those goals. It talks about how many minutes they get serviced, who's going to service them, and where they're going to get serviced. And then the last big chunk is testing and accommodations. So um, if your student is on an IEP, they'll get accommodations for district and state testing. So, for example, they might have a slower processing time. It might take them a second to figure out, you know, problem solving, things like that. Then they'll get extra time for their state tests. So this is the process. The process, as a disclaimer, it takes time. Teachers need to adjust instruction. We need to perform interventions, analyze the data, and then we come back to the table and see how those interventions worked, if they worked, if they didn't work. Um, labeling a child with a disability is something that we take seriously and we need data to back up our decisions. So if you suspect your child has a disability, you can request an evaluation for testing. You can ask the teacher, you can send an email, um, to principal, counselor, anybody, and we will send that information to the psychologist. Um, then the team comes together, we decide, yes, um, we agree, we think this child really, we need to look at them closer, we need to put in some interventions, see how they do, because regular class in, um, instruction might not be working for them. That's when we do the interventions, check the data, come back to the table. And then once we get parental consent, if we say, yes, this child, we need to look at them further, we need to test them, then the district has 60 days to complete that testing. Once that testing is finished, we the school psychologist puts a report together called an ETR, an evaluative, evaluative team report. Um, it has input from all school personnel who work with that child. At this meeting, the team will discuss the testing results and determine if the student has a disability. So the whole team decides and comes together, yes, we think the student has a disability that's affecting their education, or no, we do not think that. And then if the team says, yes, we do think that your child has a disability that's adversely affecting their education, then we have 30 days to write the IEP and hold that meeting. Once we have the, the IEP meeting, the services begin right away. So at Parkmore, what does this look like? Your child is a general education student first. They will spend the majority of their day with their peers. If they're on an IEP, they're on a general education student before they're a special education student. So most of their day, will be with their peers. If your child is on an IEP, they'll be serviced by me or somebody else um, according to the goals and the minutes outlined on their IEP. So some students see me for just a little bit of time, some students see me for more time, depending on um, how high their needs are. And then based off that ETR, the evaluative team report, your child may or may not qualify for speech therapy, physical therapy, therapy and, and or occupational therapy. And speech therapy is, um, you know, your speech. 
physical therapy is their gross motor and their occupational therapy it's fine motor like your handwriting your very um specific skills so these are more um in-depth uh, descriptions of our related services so occupational therapy your child might have bad handwriting but if it doesn't adversely affect their education and their academics they will will not receive ot so we don't want to be pulling students out of class to work on their handwriting and missing that core instruction if it's not um adversely affecting them we don't want to waste that take away that really good class instruction to work on something if it's not the bigger deal if that makes sense um same with physical therapy and speech so your child might be clumsy but that doesn't mean that they will get uh, physical therapy services okay so things that you could receive in the um your students IEP depending on if they need it or not so all students will get small group instruction um they might need some visual aids they might need their assignments modified they might need their assignments chunked into more man manageable parts for them um they might have or might need access to manipulatives they might need extended time to complete their testing and their assignments and um Repetition of skills is what we work on a lot in the classroom. So these are just other random notes at the end of my presentation, things that didn't really fit in other um, slides. So these IEP meetings, they're held once a year. The ETR meetings, the, those are held once every three years. And then the IEP team consists of the intervention specialists, the parent, the gen ed teachers, the district rep, and the related services. And then IEPs exist to support students whose dis disability adversely affects their learning. So it's possible for students to have a disability and not need an IEP. And then lastly, there are different types of placement. And this is all based on the disability, the team's decision, and or available space. So at Parkmore, we have um, high incidence classrooms, and that's it. Other class or other schools might have classes for students who have more severe disabilities, or um, classes for students who have more um, higher emotional needs. So, depending on the di disability and where there's open space in the district, is where your child will be. And then that is all I have. Thank and you, Mrs. Graybuck. You're welcome. That was a wonderful, thorough presentation about special education services, IEPs and ETRs. And at our school, we do have two teachers as Mrs. Raybuck and Mrs. Um, Ms. Atkins. And so um, students are divided by grade level, but they do support one another and, as well as all of the teachers. And so you will find if a child is on an IEP at our school, the special education teachers do go into the general education classroom. They co-teach, they co-plan, they attend all of the field trips. Um, we practice inclusion at our school. So um, we don't um, have students on IEPs um, be deemed or looked at as outliers or all oh, those are the IEP students. It's not like that at all. So if a child is on an IEP, no one would know. Um, if they were to come into our school, we service all of our children inclusively. So um, I want to reserve um, time for at least two questions before we move over to Mrs. King, who's going to talk about a 504. So any question about special education services? Dr. Campbell, can I say a couple of things? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Ms. Raybuck, for that presentation. Um, there's one thing I want to mention to parents. Um, I know Dr. Campbell mentioned that this is an informational meeting. Um, and that's really important, especially when we're doing dealing with a topic like special education, because all of it is confidential. Um, so 
Um, parents, please keep that in mind when asking this question that this meeting is being recorded. Um, a couple things I want to say is IEP is not just extra help. Um, we are saying that a child has a disability. Um, at school, we do not do any diagnosis. So we do not diagnose for um, various things like uh, ADHD or anything like that. You would talk to you know, your pediatrician, your medical team, doctor team, things like that. Um, the school has a right to try interventions as well as fair to your child to try interventions prior to um, putting a label on your child. Um, and that's something that we definitely practice here at Parkmore. Um, professionally, that is where my heart lies um, because I want to use the ETR, the special education process, as a last resort um, because we do want to give children chances, especially with the pandemic and everything going on. Um, give a child a chance to learn those skills prior to putting in uh, specific supports for that child. Um, and then also to lastly, I want to say that these are team decisions um, and they're data driven. So we have the data needs to show X, Y, and Z um, on why we're making the decisions that we need to make. Very good points, Ms. Mitchell. Thank you for bringing those up. Thank you. All right, Ms. King, 504. You're on mute, sweetie. Okay, a 504 is very differently than, uh, or very different than an IEP. Um, a 504 is where um, the students can receive accommodations if they are eligible for a 504. And um, the things that will qualify them for a 504 is they have to have a physical or mental impairment that substantially uh, limits one or more life major activities. And some of those things would be anything that ends with ING. It could be running, bending. Um, so anything like that. And a lot of students we do have um, that have ADHD, some are on 504s, um, but it has to substantially limit their um, major life activities, and it also needs to impact their academics. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. Well, the, we do go through a process for a 504. Uh, we will meet as a team that includes the parents and look at all the concerns. Information is gathered from medical reports, um, their academics. It could be any behavior reports. Um, so we take all of those things into play. And it would also be good to get information if the child has a diagnosis to get something in writing from the doctor for that. Um, and then once all that information is gathered, we will look at the information, the team will decide this student is eligible for a 504. And again, a 504 will give accommodations, uh, whereas an IEP does modifications. Um, accommodations will just, change how the student accesses the curriculum. With the 504, we don't change the curriculum. There's not a pullout program or anything like that. The only thing they probably could be pulled out for would be testing where they can receive extended time. Um, so that's kind of the difference between a 504 and an IEP. Um, with an IEP, there's specialized instruction with the 504, we can do, again, accommodations, things like maybe sitting closer to the teacher, um, breaking their instructions down into smaller chunks. But even once we um, break those down into smaller chunks, they still will be responsible for the entire assignment. So I think that's pretty much it for 504. Yes, thank you, Mrs. King. Thank you for that information. And so we do hope that 
you all have a better understanding on the difference between an IEP and a 504. And we welcome any questions at this time. Please be mindful of what Ms. Mitchell said. We don't want to use student names. Just say my child or I have a question about. And um, we are going to take two questions at this time before we move on to our gifted portion, but we because we want to reserve time at the end of the presentation for any other questions. So any questions before we moved over to the gifted portion? Hi, Ms. Campbell. No, no questions for me. I'm already hit. All right. Thank you, Ms. Right. <laughs> All right. All right. So now we're going to move to Mrs. Galbraith, and she's going to share her screen and discuss gifted services. What does the gifted services look like? How is a child identified as gifted? All right, so um, here at, in Columbus City Schools, we are very lucky because we have a very uh, extremely large gifted and talented program that has a lot of varied services. Uh, the state does not mandate that a district provide any gifted services. They do mandate that we identify kids in four areas, which are superior cog, a specific academic, such as reading, math, or science, social studies. Um, also, we do creative thinking, and we do visual and um, performing arts. So it is mandated by the state that we provide identification for those areas. Luckily, our district does provide um, services. So each district will, will um, decide how services are provided based on how they want to use the test scores. So in our district, we, um, let's start with the testing. There's a identification process to get kids um, into the gifted program. So every year um, we do a whole, whole grade level screenings and we do those for IQ at, at, um, at um, second and it says six, but it's fifth grade level. We do, and so we do an IQ test at both those grades so the kids can identify as superior cog or um, creative thinking. So to get an identification as a superior cog, um, you have to have an IQ score of 127. If you, that's one, two standard deviations above the norm. If you, um, in our district, we offer service for creative thinking children, which is just one standard deviation above if they show characteristics of creativity. That is a way to make sure that we're including as many kids as possible into our program. So that's how we identify in those two areas. We also do um, whole grade level testing with the iReady test. We test for the reading and the math. So they'll have multiple opportunities to get tested and identified in reading and math through the iReady, and they have to hit a 95th percentile. When they, um, we also, so that's for grades second, third, fourth, and fifth in elementary school. The iReady test is not on an approved state list to identify kids in kindergarten and first grade. So because of that, we try to offer as much opportunity to get in people individually tested. So in first grade, they don't get the, the iReady won't, will not, they will not immediately identify them. But what it does do is if they hit that 95th percentile, we will automatically test them to see if we can get them identified using the Iowa test, which we will do individually. There's no expense to you. We come to the school. We do it as easily as possible. To do, to do that, that's done automatically. We use a screening score of 94 percentile, so one level below what the qualifying score would be. 
So the other opportunity is, is that anybody can say, well, my child may be not performing well on the iReady test, but I see a potential there, or a teacher sees a potential there, or a parent, anyone, even a child can submit themselves for individual-based testing. The form is a very simple form. It's on the Gifted and Talented website pay, um, page. So if you, I'll show you here. So it, this is our Gifted and Talented um, website in the district under departments. If you go down the page a little bit, oh, I got some things in my way here. Oh, I lost it. One second, I'm sorry. How did I get here? I think I'm on the wrong. Get back to my presentation. Okay, so on this page here, if you go down the page a bit, you can see that they will go ahead and tell you exactly how to do it, but it's right directly on the Gifted and Talent webpage. There is a link for each thing, for each type of alternative testing. Right now it's closed. It will open up again for gifted and talented, for the gifted and talented um, individual testing on the 18th. In my presentation, I have the, the page linked so that it will automatically go. So if someone needs this information, we can share this um, presentation with you and you'll just simply click on the link. So on the 18th, we will open up for anyone to submit anyone for individualized testing. That means they do not have to be at the 95th percentile to get the testing. They can just, if someone sees the potential in them, we want to go ahead and refer them. If you feel like your child might falling in the category of not being noticed for their academic ability, if you could reach out to your teachers or the gifted department or go to the website and submit that form, I am happy to do it. If you reach out to your principal, I will submit the paperwork for you. At that point, they will mail a letter home to you to ask for permission to test, and then we come directly to the school to test you. So once we can get you identified, then we offer several services. And the gifted department has, at the elementary level, several different programs. The most well-known one is the three through five program. That is where kids are identified in reading or math or superior cog, and they go to their teacher that's assigned to their building every day. So if they're assigned gifted and identified gifted in reading, they would be with that reading teacher and they would give their instruction every day of the week. Same thing for math. If they're identified in superior cog, they would get instruction for reading and math every day. That teacher, would be their teacher of record. Then there's the K2 program, which is the part of the program I am with. And we provide um, services. We do 225 minutes a week for kids that are identified gifted in reading. We do not have services currently for math. And I come to the building, um, to buildings that have um, students. I have five buildings assigned to me and I spend two days a week working with the kids that are identified. They will get two, two half days of services for reading. I also see kids that are superior cop. Some, um, some schools are also assigned a PETS person, which is a primary thinking program, which we do in the district to try to increase and, uh, and find students young that may not have been identified yet so that we can get them identified. At this point, it's really important to make sure that we are, that no children are being missed. Gifted children grow the least every year because their needs are often overlooked. Um, they're they're not the they're not you, not always the priority because they are succeeding, and everyone's like, "Oh, that's great! They're doing wonderful." But those kids do need a different education, so they have every right to continue to grow, just like the average child and the child that's needing some special services. So that's the department, that's what we have to offer in, in services that could possibly be at, a, at like Parkmore. We also, if your child is in third, fourth and fifth grade and you 
have a reading and math identification. We also have a school, a gifted school, where some parents will choose to send their children. If they um, qualify for that services, they can go there um, for third, fourth, and fifth grade. And they pro we provide the transportation. All kids that are currently identified will be getting a letter at the end of March, which will offer services. Parents have to choose the services for their children. So when you get the letter, you need to respond back. Otherwise, they will stay at their home school and not get service. So if your child's in third or fifth grade and identified gifted, and you don't give permission for them to go into that gifted classroom that's at your school where, where they could get service every day, they will not get it. So it's really important to ask questions because we are definitely here to make sure that your child's getting what you need. So um, I could go into more detail about the programs, but I feel like that's gonna take a lot of time. <laughs> So if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. Know that if you have any inkling that your child might need some gifted services, please let us know so that we can get them tested and try to get them into the right program. Thank you so much, Mrs. Galbraith. That was a very thorough explanation of gifted services. And I thank you for providing this information because I don't think um, we've really talked about that with our parents, the gifted services that are available at Parkmore. And um, I want us to be a little bit more intentional as a staff. And this is why um, I wanted the gifted portion to be presented because your child can be identified as early as kindergarten. Um, so Mrs. Galbraith, if you could stop sharing your screen. Well, one, one second, I'd like to add one more thing. If you, okay. um, if you have, if you have a, a kindergarten child that's, ex that is excelling, we begin testing them very soon. So we, the, the, the testing will begin probably in March. So parents of kindergarten parents, if you're seeing something or teachers, if you're out there and finding one, please let's connect so that we can get them set up to be individually tested so they can get the correct services. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Galbraith. And as she stated, please reach out to me. Reach out to the classroom teacher. Um, I believe wholeheartedly that parents see gifts that we may not see at the school. If your child is reading above grade level, if your child um, conversation level is higher than most children their age, or they're able to solve math problems that are above their grade level, definitely submit their names for them to be tested. It doesn't hurt for them to be tested. They're either going to be identified or not identified. It's not a ding against them if they're not identified, but at least you try to get them tested. It's better for them to be tested by our gifted department and then they can, be, they can become identified and start to receive those services that they need to grow more um, as a gifted child because they do receive additional supports outside of the classroom. Um, if they're in third, fourth, and fifth grade, they have a different curriculum that they follow. So they actually go through two different curriculums um, in our school because the children can handle it. And um, I'll tell you, a lot of children who may have behavior problems in the classroom could be because they are bored. They are above what is being taught in the classroom. And one of the tests that we give at the school may not identify them, but if a parent, you know, make that request, guess what? Mrs. Galbraith will submit the paperwork and they will come out to the school and test your child. A lot of times kids will get busy because they need more work. And so that's the opposite end of the spectrum. So we have our special ed service on one end and our gifted services on the other end. And so um, I just want to thank all of our presenters. We have a good um, 15 minutes for questions. So parents, um, you can come off of mute. We just ask you to be mindful when you come off mute to say, excuse me first so that we know that you are speaking and not everyone just saying their question at one time. So just come off mute and say, excuse me, and then um, we will proceed with your questions. 
Uh, before that, I do want to give Ms. Wallace some space, okay? Um, because I think it's very important for parents to understand who have children on IEPs. There is a liaison and a support for you um, at the district level. She is a district employee, okay? And so she is here to support. So Ms. Wallace. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate what I do. Um, liaison for the district. I can go into an IEP meeting, a 504 meeting, an ETR meeting, any kind of meeting where the school or the parent feels, I'm just not sure what's going on. I'm, I'm really confused on this. If you could go with me, um, if there's stuff that you don't understand, if there's a meeting and let's say that they, I mean, we do use a lot of jargon in our special ed world. So I think that sometimes parents get confused or stressed out about it. Um, I want to let them know that I'm a listening ear and they can always reach out to me. Um, I do have a phone number, actually two phone numbers. So if you guys want to write those down and you can feel free to call me or email me. My phone number is, um, I work at Hudson. Well, I'm housed at Hudson. I work everywhere. <laughs> um, my phone number is 380-997-4927. Or you could call my cell, um, usually during the day, but at night too, if there's an emergency, please feel free. If it's an emergency, I will call you back. I'm a special needs mom too, so I get it. 614-636-3836. And then my email is twallace10110, the at sign columbus.k12.oh.us. So I just want the parents to know that they're never alone, that we're all in this together. Thank you, Ms. Wallace. And I also put her phone numbers in the chat if you weren't able to um, pick those up as she was saying them. Mrs. Galbraith, we have a question in the <laughs> chat about gifted services. It says, is the process for requesting testing for kindergarten gifted services the same as all other grades? Yes, I was actually just getting ready to text, text the answer out. So it is exactly the same. It's the only thing is that it's a delayed and it's not, we don't offer kindergarten testing at the beginning of the year or um, because there are not normed tests for those age levels. So the norms don't become valid until like March. They used to become valid in December. They keep moving it back. So starting in March, will be able to start the testing. The referrals are not open currently until the 18th and they can be clicked onto the page, but they're exact, it's exactly the same. We'll fill out the same form. Basically, it's just putting in basic data and saying that we want them tested. So if a if parent reaches out, I will be happy to help with that. I will go ahead and put my email underneath that question in case somebody wants to reach out to me directly. Thank you, Mrs. Galbraith. Now, one thing we didn't mention, and we won't go into much detail about it, you can have a child who is special ed and gifted. And so they're considered twice exceptional. So we don't want you to think because your child is on an IEP and they have a disability that they cannot be gifted. They can be both, okay? This can be very confusing to parents but a child can have a disability and be gifted. There's a lot of children, a that, lot of have, children. <laughs> that, have, that have disabilities that are also gifted. Mm -hmm. gifted um, so yes, do, do not let that hesitate now. That should not be an issue. We're trained to deal with that. Yeah, so I wanted to make sure we were clear about that. Yeah. Um, that because your child is on an IEP, it does not rule out them no, me too. for those services. All right. Any other questions? Well, I do hope this session was helpful and you all may be still reflecting <laughs> because there was quite a bit of information shared this evening and you may want to review your notes that you took during this presentation and possibly contact the school. You can always reach out to our school psychologist, Ms. Mitchell, um, and she is very helpful. Right, and, 
um, respond to any questions you may have. You can also reach out to Mrs. King, our school um, counselor, and myself, and just say that you have a question about special education, or you have a question about gifted. Oh, we have a we have a hand, Miss Conte. Yes, ma'am. How Good are evening. you? Fine. Um, I'm really fine. Um, that was a lot of information, but um. I have a question to ask. So if one has a child that is in one of the therapies that has a special education, how does the parents keep up with the progress of the child? For example, if a child is in um, physical therapy or in speech therapy, I believe um, the child goes to uh, therapy on a weekly basis. I, I, can, I stand corrected though. Um, what are the progresses of the child and what is the therapist doing with the child in school? The parents need to know. So how does the parents keep up with that? Great question. I think Mr. Sullivan wants to take this one. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that question. So the to clarify, you're referring to a student who has a IEP goal for a specific therapy. Exactly. And yeah, so... In section seven of their IEP, it should let you know exactly, uh, Ms. Raybuck kind of mentioned that specially designed instruction and related service portion. Um, that In that section seven, it'll say related services and it'll say, so in terms of how many minutes the students will be seen and on, on a weekly basis or three times a month, things like that, that are common, that'll be in that section. And then in the IEP, it also notes every nine weeks, whenever grade cards are put home, so whenever the student gets a grade card, they also get what's called a progress report. And in the progress report, for every goal and objective that they have, they will have um, measurable data that relates to those goals and objectives, so what progress they've made over the course of the last nine weeks. So as long as they have a goal or an objective related to that specific therapy, or if it's academic, same thing, um, that will um, give them, that'll give information to the parent through that process. Okay, noted. Um, I haven't received any progress report yet since she started school. Um, but let's say um, the progress report is sent home. Um, most of the kids that are in um, that has IEP that are in speech therapy or occupational therapy, they do have private therapies and would like this, it, um, private therapy and the school therapy to be on the same page. Mm -hmm. So whatever yes. that the school is doing, that needs to be shared with the parents so the parents can share mm -hmm. with the private therapist so that they'll have the child on the same page and they don't get the child confused because the private therapy could be on something something different and the school therapy could be on something else and that would get the child confused. That's a good point, Ms. Conte. I've noted that and I will be sending this information to our um, specialized support services in the morning and um, okay. assisting Mr. Sullivan on that. He has provided his email address in the chat. Okay. Yeah, and I would just add on to um, what Dr. Campbell just shared. If, if you have, um, if you wanna send me um, a more specific question related to your student or, or, or um, more specific questions, um, I, I can maybe help facilitate that process. I know that our related service providers are happy to do that. Sometimes the barrier to that process, because it is confidential, like Ms. Mitchell mentioned earlier, is getting a release of record sign. Um, so if we have a release of information, then um, we could work with like, we frequently would collaborate with, um, you know, therapists at Children's Hospital or other outside um, places where they, that provides speech um, or physical or occupational therapy um, in a in a clinical setting, because I uh, you're you're exactly spot on, Miss Conte, in saying that we want the student to be um, working collaboratively in both settings, so we're not, um, you know, not being as efficient as effective as possible to help facilitate their growth in that area. Okay, I've copied um, your number, but in any case, I'll speak to 
to the class teacher and I'll have your information and, and I'll reach out to you. Yeah. Okay. I believe there was one more question, someone on an iPhone. It just says iPhone. Maybe not. All right, I'm going to stop recording.